This is the uh, regular meeting of the Franklin Plant Board. This is November uh, 17, 2015. We'll jump right in. Uh, I always know when our insurance agents are, are present because they get top billing on the agenda. We, we get lower premiums that way, don't we? <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, well, the first item tonight is an information item, and it's an explanation the Frankfurt Plant Board insurance policies and coverages. So I didn't know who was going to uh, address this issue. Hansel, yes. Just from Charlie Hamilton here with us this evening. He's going to present a brief overview of uh, the various policies of coverage that the uh, that the Plant Board maintains, and some issues about additional insureds and our coverage limits. If I can interrupt just a second, uh, I jumped the gun here and. I forgot to ask Kathy to call the roll of members, please. Member Ludwig? Here. Member Green? Here. Member Pogratsky? Present. Member Baldwin? Here. Member Rosen? Here. Thank you. All present. Excuse me, Charles. Um, I've given uh, Hans a premium summary. I do this every year. I think it just kind of gives you a brief summary of the policies and the premiums and show some limits and all on there. I, I think one of the issues that I think that is being asked about is the liability limits. And uh, we presently, for the plant board, have a 20 million liability limit for the umbrella that fits over the auto and general liability. Um, I think there's been some concern about the adequacy of that, which we've never had a claim come anywhere near that in all the years that I've written. And I think there might have been some other concerns about whether we could name anybody else as an additional insurer on the policy, which is not really, can't do that unless they have an insurable interest of any nature. And if they have an insurable interest, we could do that. I couldn't just put somebody's name on my automobile policy if they don't have an interest in it. And kind of the same thing there. Um, I'm not sure any other issues or concerns that the the board might have. I mean, we feel like you have some pretty adequate limits on the liability side, but you'd have to have an awfully big claim to hit that. Would you state again, what is the uh, umbrella limit? 20 million. 20 million. That fits over the million general liability and the million on the automobile liability. Also fits over the limits on the employer's liability, but that usually doesn't come into play. That's on the workers' comp. And on the subject of whether you can add other parties as additional insurers, is this is this uh, uh, pretty much a firm and fast rule in yes. the industry? Unless there's contractual responsibility or there is an ownership or something there on it, like I say, it'd be like me adding my name to your automobile policy and there'd be no way to do that. I have no interest in your automobile. So normally in times when we do that, there's a contract or an agreement that requires that the plant board name whomever as an additional insured or there has to be some other interest, insurable interest for it to work. Because then you could do something like that, but unless there's an interest, the coverage wouldn't apply. So would your opinion be that the city of Frankfurt, which is an incorporated municipality in the Frankfurt plant board, which is a separate incorporated just the fact that they're both municipal corporations, that would not be enough of a no, sir. Any more than in there to do that? right? Any more than naming uh, Corbin municipality on your policy? It's a municipality too. The, I, I think the point again is whether there's uh, any other party would have an interest with the plant board, an insurable interest, and that's the key thing: is an insurable interest, or there had to be a contractual agreement or requirement. That requires you to do that. Other than that, I don't know of any way you could legally do it or provide coverage. Um, members, any questions and comments for Charles? It's not. What is the highest um, claim you've ever had? You said nothing close to the highest one that you have you ever reserved right now on one. I, I think it's kind of over reserved, to be honest, and it's at 50000 it's a general liability claim where someone allegedly was electrocuted. We never heard about it. The plan board never did. An attorney got a hold of the sentence letter. We haven't really heard much since then. It's kind of going back and forth. But 
don't think the person was badly injured, but that's that was the largest one. I, I really feel like the exposure on the plant boards are more from the automobile standpoint. I'm more concerned that a vehicle would run over and hit somebody and get them badly injured as far as you're having a liability claim. The largest we've had over the years has been 50,000 okay. from a liability standpoint. Perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Charles. Okay, thank you. The next item is uh, it's an action item. Again, it's insurance. Uh, consider renewal of stop loss coverage with Pan American for the 2016 FPB employee health plan. And I see uh, Robin Curry and Lisa Stam there here with us this evening. And of course, uh, Diane. Thank you. Um, I had uh, revised the agenda item. I want to make sure the board members received a copy based on in from information that we received after the board package deadline. Um, but Lisa and Robin are here to uh, go over the um, stop loss recommendation for next year. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. We are here this evening to ask approval of the stop loss renewal from Pan American. And it, we actually have a very favorable renewal this year in spite of some very large claims, which the stop loss carrier Pan American paid out. Uh, I think they paid out nearly a million dollars in claims this year. And, and still we have a renewal that is actually under your current in terms of premium and um, with no additional liability for the member that uh, they paid out the significant claims for. At, at first, they were going to uh, uh, put $200,000 in additional liability. Actually, I think it was $275,000 in additional liability yes. on that member, and uh, they have since dropped that requirement. So that member will be at the same $75,000 specific deductible that every other member is at. And so we would recommend that you renew with Pan American. Last uh, last meeting, uh, we uh, approved MedBan for the uh, insurance, for general insur health insurance and so forth. Now, now what we're addressing now is strictly the stop loss contract. Correct. Any questions for Lisa or Robin? Just to clarify, one of the things that made a change was the um, <clears throat> The laser effect, that's where you laser out one person or a group of individuals uh, and say that, that their deductible would be higher than the others because of a, a known or existing condition. Is that correct? Is that's that, correct. And that now has been removed so correct. that everyone is the same. Yes. Okay, anything else? Uh, if not, uh, this is a significant item, so I think the vote should be taken by a member. Uh, vote yes is to uh, contract. Excuse me. Need a motion. Need a motion. Okay. I'm sorry. Need a motion. Okay. Need a motion. I move that we accept the uh, stop loss coverage uh, with Pan American for the 2016 employee health plan. Second. I'll second. Discussion. Now we'll vote. Okay. The vote yes is to make this contract with Pan American for stop loss. The vote no would be to not make the contract. <coughs> Kathy. Member Ludwig? Yes. Okay. Member Green? Yes. Member Pogrotsky? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. yes. Okay. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Ron. Back on track. Action item concerning approving the minutes for the October 20, 2015 regular board meeting. Uh, Kathy's prepared the minutes. Everybody's had the opportunity to uh, review them. Uh, she's done her usual fine job, lengthy. Uh, do we have any comments or questions or anything about the minutes? I make a motion we approve the minutes of the October 20th board meeting. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Yep. Do we have any discussion? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes as submitted say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Uh, hearing no no's, uh, the motion carries. Okay. 
Next item is a regular monthly item, action item, electric, water, and cable, financial and statistical data for October 2015. And that's David. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, members of the board. Good evening. I'd like to start at page 25 and go over, starting with the statement of net position. For those in the viewing public or those here tonight, the statement of net position is just a governmental nonprofit word for the balance sheet of the Frankfurt Plant Board. This just gives us a snapshot in time of, of where we stand. So as of October 31st, 2015, the Frankfurt Plant Board had total assets on line 70 of $151,858,000. Of that, our, most of our assets are concentrated in our property, plant, and equipment, net of our accumulated depreciation. That's approximately 67% of our assets, as you would expect with a utility company. If you uh, look on line 75 through 125, our total liabilities as of this date are 84376000 If you were to, to net these two, take our assets, subtract the liabilities current and long term from the Frankfurt Plant Board, you come to our net position on lines 130 through 155. We show a total on line 160, total net position of the Frankfurt Plant Board as of October 31st, 2015 of $67,482,000 bringing total liabilities in that position, equaling our assets of $151,858,000. I'd be glad to go any in depth into any item uh, on this statement. If there are no questions, I'd just move on to our cash and investment summary we have on page 26. I just wanted to point this out. This is something that's uh, required by our investment policy to provide to the board monthly. And just want to state that we've got that here for you to review, showing our restricted, non unrestricted cash and investments. Um, on page 27, when we look at a snapshot of the company from a particular date, we also have a statement of revenue, expense, and changes in that position that gives us a running total of where we were as on the month and also through the four months of this fiscal year. So on line 27, I'm sorry, page 27. I'd like to focus on the third column of year-to-date actual activity and just go at a company level to show you the <coughs> revenue expenses and where the company sits in, in our financial performance for the period. So on line 50, total revenue for the company at 300, sorry, three, $35,165,000 against expenses for the period of $29,588,000 giving a change in net position for this fiscal year of $5.576 million for the period. I would like to point out that we've had uh, two payments related to, to billing settlement that were is in favor of the plant board that have made these financial results look better than expected. If you take that out, we are really much on track with our budgeted figures um, for the period. Just want to make, make that a statement. I think that's something worth considering when you look at where we sit through the four months of the year. We have provided a detailed company-wide statement of revenue expense and change in net position, in addition to each individual divisional uh, summary for you. And also have in here, as we do every month, a summary of all of the cash balances and our main operating checking account check register and impress check register, just to give you a little look into what happened through the month. Uh, I'd be glad to go into any questions you may have, but that's a, a quick summary of where the plant board sits. Uh, four months. Members? Well, maybe everyone out already understands it, but um, the um, fourth column from the right, um, it's in parentheses, so it's a negative number there. Why is that one negative? Or We're looking at on line 15, the year-to-date budget amount. We are showing that the electric division, based on our budgeted revenues, we budget revenues based on a load forecast, what we expected in usage time, the rate for each customer, and the expenses of the division. We actually showed at this point of the year that we thought the company would be in a negative uh, statement of net position change for the period. So we're showing the electric uh, division is doing better than expected. So. Um, as a company, we you never you break even is a good number, but through this period of the budget, that's where we sat. Um, the revenues of the electric division and others don't necessarily go in a, in a uniform cycle, so there's higher uses usage amounts. But at this period, we thought we would be uh, 
I would say when you look at this, this size of figures at a break even point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Well, that's uh, we're a third of the way into the uh, through the uh, fiscal year, aren't we? Four months. And yes, sir. We're on, on things, our way. Things are looking pretty good. Doing okay. Um, I'll move that uh, we accept the uh, electric, water, and cable financial and statistical data for October 2015, submitted by Mr. Denton. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Do we have any discussion? If none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Uh, hearing no no's, uh, the motion carries. All right, we're into uh, departmental reports. Uh, cable. Thank you. Starting on page 61, uh, George Henry and our telephone department puts together this first report each month. And so I asked him last month that I was having trouble reading the last chart and uh, if he could blow it up a little bit so I could see it. At the same time, I recognize that we use quite a few acronyms. So I asked him to come up with a second sheet in behind on page 62. So over the course of time, we can remind our board members that have been up, been there for a while what these are and our, our new our new board members that we could not use jargon or if we do at least we'll have an explanation for what some of our jargon is and so I ask you to put this together this is always a work in progress where we are more than happy to uh, to provide you uh, the board with uh, the type of information that you want but uh, what he did do was uh, was was put together a top 10 or 11 uh, type of trouble calls that we had over the month of October again they're Kind of generic in a way, uh, and, and our customer service reps and those folks out in the other in the cable telecom department uh, try and fit the trouble as it comes in into certain blocks. And sometimes it doesn't fit great, well, and sometimes it, it does okay. But you can see that uh, a lot of the, the trouble we have is with equipment. Uh, the customer owns some of that, uh, be it computers or laptops or gaming systems, uh, TVs, a little bit of everything. Uh, set-top boxes, out of almost 14,000 set-top boxes, we had 109 with a problem, which that's a pretty small percentage overall, and uh, a lot of wiring issues, but a lot of these things are there, uh, month in and month out, uh, from a wiring perspective anyway. On the DTA, a d digital terminal adapter, 52 troubles out of about almost 14,000 units in service, so that's a pretty, pretty low percentage of problems there. Most of the time, when we have problems on those, it's dead. It won't come back, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna work anymore. Um, the MTAs on the bottom end are the, uh, are the, are the telephone units. I don't know how many of those we have out there off the top of my head, but I would say it's probably close to 8,000 or so uh, units in service. So it's a, it's a small percentage, unless it's yours. Uh, is usually how that works, and we get, it, get out there and get it fixed as quickly as we can. On page 63 was a rather light month for uh, for major trouble. We had a couple of power supply failures and uh, and, and some uh, feeder problems. Made it a really a really slow month on that, which we were thankful for. Uh, moving on to page 64, as far as where our numbers are, where we wanted them to be from a budget perspective, we're pretty close on cable. Uh, we're 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 a little ahead, but uh, from a, from a numbers perspective. Uh, but we're, we're still pretty even on the on the dollars and cents perspective of it. Pretty even on preferred broadband. We're a little ahead of schedule. Um, telephone. Uh, I think we're averaging over the course of the last three or four months, 60 or 61 fewer lines per month. Uh, I think the average 61. I can't remember exactly the exact number, but it's about 60 or 61. Uh, security is kind of staying pretty stagnant, and the video on demand. Uh, it's a little better in the last few months, but it's still a little below the average we want of about 2,700. So we're just under that a little bit. We usually see the summer movies, the big blockbusters that came out in the summer. You'll see those on video on demand at Christmas time. And so you'll see, hopefully, a little colder outside. Folks are staying home a little bit more. The blockbusters are out. You'll see your numbers come up at the winter time. That's usually how that works. So we will see how that works out over the course of the next few months. I'd be happy to uh, answer any question you might have on these reports. I have a question, but I have one, one request. Yeah. That first chart with the trouble call resolution. Mm -hmm. could, next month, can we get some trend data? I'm sorry? Can we get some trend data sure. on those calls? On page 61. On page 61, that chart there at the top. No problem. 12 months, 18. Uh, past year, I think. Okay. 
No problem. Whatever fits on the page. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. Anything else for John? If not, uh, we'll move to customer service, Monique. The notice that the customer service reports are located on page 65 and 66. Uh, total call volumes for the month was 7,138. You will notice on page 65 that we have had some decrease in the week over week calls year over year. And we attribute that to many of our customers have begun using the customer portal. They've also been taking care of some of their more simple questions via email to the customer service department. So that has freed up a little bit of our, our phone lines and then also reduced some of the call volume that we have in the, store, in the um, front office during the day. Still, we have an average of about 325 calls coming in to the departments during the day. Uh, walking customers, um, billing, about 859 during the month of service, 1,075 with a total of 1,934. Average walking customers during the day is about 88 customers. Total new accounts created for the month of October was a little lower than it was last month with about 196. The implementation of the authorized users on the customer accounts has been going along smoothly for the most part and members of the department are beginning to work uh, on the rate classification cleanup. I'll answer any questions that you may have. Well, can you explain a little bit more about the rate class clarification? Rate classification, classification cleanup, and we're working with IT to have the rate classifications go automatically back. We have a, when the customer comes in, if, it, if the property is a landlord-owned property, it, because it is a commercial property, it falls under the rate classification of 15. When it is rented by a tenant, it's under a residential classification. So IT is helping us to go back and make that automatic so that the individual CSRs do not have to do so much legwork in moving that from the general class back to the residential class and vice versa. Anything else for Monique, members? It's not. See, electric. Uh. Yes, board. You turn to page 67 for your safety graph. For the month of uh, October, we had a total of 40 outages in the electric department. The majority of those outages in October was a result from, again, uh, wildlife, some trees, and uh, we actually had a pole hit by a car, which that will be next next board meeting you'll see that we had three poles so far so today's date since friday night we've had three poles hit this last three days so that's subject to change but uh, as you see the safety graph we're still running where we you know we're a little we're not real real high we're running about 33 minutes per customer for an outage so we're, we're comfortable with that right now due to the due to the nature of the outages and if you look at page 68 you'll see the y graph which breaks out all the different kind of outages we have and uh, just tells you how many we've had in comparison to years past and increase or decrease that we may have also. Uh, I think the last time we showed you all a few pictures of East Main substation was just primarily of us setting a new transformer in place. Uh, since then we've, we've, moved, we've made some good headway. Uh, just a few pictures to show you just some of the steel we put up and some switches and mechanisms. This is one on the 69 side of the transformer. Incoming voltage, uh, you can flip. Then that's just an outside picture that shows you where the transport we did set. You've got the outside other, the low side bay is completely built, all the steels erected, and we've primarily got all the switches up now. We're one more slide, I guess, and you'll start to see we're starting to put tubing across through there. So we're making headway and we'll continue working on it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, the car is hitting poles. Was that probably rain or did it just? Um, most of DUI, I'll be honest. Most of them are from car wrecks. Oh, okay. So, so this this past Friday night, Sunday morning, and I don't know about last night. Those were DUIs, and then we had one last night down Home Street. And I don't know if that gentleman's they didn't tell us whether or not. Okay. So. But yeah. Anything else, Mr. Scott? Okay. Siba. 
Mr. Chairman, you go to page 72 in your uh, board package. Uh, you'll see a graph there indicating uh, our profit and loss over the last uh, 2010, 14, and then the, in red is the current 2015. Uh, SEPA runs two months behind our board meeting, so we're talking about the uh, energy that we sold in September, and you'll see a uh, red bar underneath the uh, uh, line for September. You go to page 73, go across the September row, you'll see that we lost $18,170 in SEPA for the month of September. If you go to the next page, You'll see that since uh, our SEPA inception in 1997, uh, we've made a profit of $10.4 million through uh, our SEPA hydropower. I've added a couple more um, slides than usual. I included the entire package that we get from Owensboro uh, that lists sort of all the other utilities and how they're doing with their SEPA energy and be glad to answer any questions you may have. Is the low amount for September, is that due to, as the river runs, they're working on the dam? Is the low amount for September due to working on the dam, on repairs? Uh, no, ma'am, one of the oh. things, one of the reasons why our, um, our SEPA was so low this month was we try to run the turbines when the energy is most valuable in the summer and not so much um, other off months. So we will have, we will schedule lower amounts of energy when it's not as valuable and we'll try to run the turbines more in the summer when the air conditioner loads are here and we get more, more money for them. Okay. But, oh. I guess I, I forgot that we're dealing with the fiscal year. I mean, it started in July, so so it's not as low as, as if it had been the end of the year, like like November is. So it's it's still the beginning of the time period because it's July first through July first. We keep track of our SEPA. Uh, a couple of different ways. We look oh. at it by fiscal year and calendar year both. Um, but the chart, I think is on page 73 or four, where we show a $10.4 million profit. Mm -hmm. That's on a calendar year basis. <clears throat> but in general, you know, the wetter months you have, you know, it's more opportunity to run the turbines. And if you look at the bar, the bar chart at the very beginning, page 72, you can see historically in September, October, November, you see the bar chart where yeah. we've lost money in those years, mm -hmm. September, October, November. Yeah. We typically have not run the turbines a lot in those months. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Anything else for uh, Herbie on SEPA? Not uh, we'll move on to KMEA. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, just a reminder that uh, Thursday, the 19th, two days from now, at 6 p.m., we will be having our uh, power supply question and answer session with the public. We invite the public to come. We've uh, had notifications, details on the website. Uh, I think we've run some commercials. There's been various uh, flyers that have gone around. And anyway, that will be here at the Frank at the uh, Farmers Bank community room on the fourth floor. That's the corner of Ann Street and West Main. So again, uh, this Thursday, 6 p.m., we invite anybody to come to that, and uh, we will give a thorough and in-depth update of KYMEA, the the impetus behind the organization, and kind of where we've uh, come from since we made decisions to leave Kentucky Utilities at the end of our contract. So. Uh, Hope to have a good meeting. Okay. Very good. Hmm. Safety, Kim. There are no accidents, uh, vehicle or, or OSHA recordables to report. Or, or. Water distribution. 
Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Billy Briscoe is away at a work-related meeting presently. He asked that I present the information. This is for the month of October, and the information I'll be covering briefly is contained on pages 88, 89, and 90. <clears throat> briefly, it describes that we installed 11 new services for the month of October. We had one main break and two outages. Of those outages, one was a result of the main break and the other was scheduled for maintenance. Any questions for David? Not water treatment plant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the data I have comes from page 91 in your, in your information. Uh, whereas I'm comparing the, the, the monthly production rates for 2010, 2014, 2015, during the month of October, the water treatment plant produced 233 million gallons of potable water with an average daily demand of 7.5 million gallons per day. We maintain compliance of all federal and state regulations during that time. The only thing I'd like to add is if you look at, if you look at 2010 versus 2015, of course, the, the flow rate or the demand was up in 2010, and we primarily attribute that to the amount of precipitation that we had during those times. Comparably, 2010, we had 1.27 inches of, of rain. Our production rates were up, and in 2015, we had 3.76 inches of precipitation. That's mainly our, what we attribute to usage is, is the amount of rain that we have. I'm open for any questions that you might have. Just curious, why does the amount of rain affect the amount of water we produce so dramatically? Uh, mainly is what people use, their usage, uh, whether they're using it in their yards or water, water in their plants, that kind of thing. It just... Uh, so the rain was low, you're saying? Yes. Oh, I see. It's environmental conditions. Right, sure. I thought you were making the opposite comment. Okay, anything else for Chris? Uh, not the uh, admin building. I missed it. I have one photo on page 92 that I'll refer to during my report. During the last month, electrical conduit and mechanical piping continue to be installed through the center of the building. All the concrete walls to be poured are complete, with the exception of the south wall, which will be left open for access to the interior of the building. You can see that opening on the right side of the photo. Um, all of the columns within the center of the building have been poured, and two of the walls for the general generator building were poured on Saturday. Um, current activity, they continue to perform prep work in order to begin steel erection and the plan is to begin with steel next week. And in addition, waterproofing of the ground walls is ongoing and they're preparing the floor, the center floor for a concrete pour as well, the next floor slab. It was scheduled for Friday but with the rain delays and it looks like it might be a delay tomorrow as well that may end up being pushed to next week. Um, upcoming activity includes pouring the floor slab and then they'll install the scaffolding necessary to, to prepare for the next concrete lid pour. On that photo, you can see where we've poured one concrete lid, and you can see where they've got the walkway around there. That's kind of the extent of where we'll be pouring the next concrete lid. They also plan to extend it further towards the PSC building, so they'll be erecting some more walkways as well. They're going to try to pour a pretty good amount of floor slab so they can pour more concrete lid as well. And that's all I have for my departmental report. Do you have any questions? Just <coughs> not. Head in. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, is moving along despite some of the rain that we've had. Uh, they were able to pour the roof uh, November the 5th, uh, starting on page 93. There's a, a few pictures there. The first one shows the uh, contractors pouring the, uh, the concrete portion of the roof. Uh, the picture on page 94 shows the shoring being removed after the, the roof, uh, roof was poured. Uh, the next two pictures are basically showing the, uh, the concrete block being put on the office side of the, the building. And hopefully by next week, the roof will be complete and the bar joists uh, on the office will be set uh, by the end of next week. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Anything for Adam? Thank you, Adam. Agenda item number six is an action item. 
It's to consider approval of change order number two for the administration building for a deduction of $94,775.42. This is a carryover item from, from October meeting, I believe. Yes. Last month I presented change order number two and I had a list of 15 items. Some of those were deductions, some were additions, and some were a replacement for lower cost options. I've made a, you know, as construction progresses, things they're always asking, you know, some type of change order came up. So I've made a few revisions. I included the new change order number two, which is on pages 98 and 99. And then I also included the original change order just for comparison purposes so on pages 100 and 101. But if you look at page 98 and 99, um, page 99, all of those items I presented to you last month, I did take a few of those off and I'm going to present that during the next agenda item. So if you flip over to page 99, the changes that you'll see are items number 12 and items number 13. During discussions with the steel erection company, they've determined that we needed one more steel beam to go over the health and wellness center to support the future terrace, so that was going to be an addition. So in order to try to make it as close to cost neutral as I could, um, we're going to switch out the automatic faucets in the six private restrooms. We have two, our two private restrooms per floor, and we're going to switch those out to manual faucets. So that helped create a, almost a cost neutral deduction. And we also had one additional item that I presented to you last month. It was for some door hardware changes where our architect has been coordinating with the state. And we t completely removed that from the list for now. They're still doing some coordination, but basically it's just addressing what type of locks we're going to put on a couple of the doors. So I'll bring that to you at a future board meeting. So other than that, everything else was the same and um, staff recommends approval of change order number two. So this uh, results in a reduction in cost of oh. 94775 Yes, correct. And that, that summary of cost reduction is on page four on the Executive yes. Digest. Okay. Members? I move for approval of change order number two for the administration building for a deduction of nine, uh, $94,775.42. I'll second the motion. Discussion. I hear none. Uh, we'll call for the vote on this by member, please. Uh, vote yes is to approve the change order number two. Vote no would be to not approve the change order. Yes. Member Green? Yes. Member Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. Okay. Next item is also a change order. It's uh, action item number seven. Consider approval of change order number three for the administration building for, for a reduction or a deduction of $50,753. Yes. And these items were three of the items I did present last month. They're the removal of some raised planter walls in both the rear and the front of the building, along with a seating wall that we were going to have along the front of the building as well. And item number, number three is removal of the solar panels as well. It was requested that I remove these items from the original change order and open the floor to board discussion on these items. And in my thoughts, like I have two thoughts about the two different groups, the planners and the, and the seating area. My concerns there are, you know, as we learned with uh, the head-in building, you know, we have some responsibility to, to generate a piece of architecture that flows well into the environment. And given the, the elevation of the overall building, I'd like to have a better understanding of how the removal of those walls, is to, those raised planters is going to affect that outer aesthetic. And then my second concern around those is um, I think we need to provide a nice, inviting public space for the employees and for the customers as they come and would like to actually have a better understanding of how uh, the change in the seating is going to affect that and what the longevity of the seating is compared to um, 
the, the, the retrofit for the bench is the replacement. Okay, and I'll just explain our thought sure. process behind removing this. Um, for the item number one, removing the raised planter walls, and I do have an exhibit in your board package as well on page 104. And starting with number one, if you look at the back of the building, I have, you know, I had that arrow point says removed raised planter walls on there. If you, you can't really see it really, really well on this drawing, but to the right there, there actually is going to be one seating wall. So instead of having the raised seating around both of those landscaping islands and the seating wall, we elected to remove the raised planter walls, but maintain that seating wall. In addition, in that rear pathway, the walk pathway in the back, we're gonna have four benches back there as well and location to be determined once we get the landscaping in place and we'll determine the best location for those benches. So that was our thought there. We'll still have seating in the back of the building. Um, item number two was the same thing. You can look, you'll see I have an arrow in another note saying remove raised planter walls with an arrow there. We are going to remove those as well. Both of those landscape islands, we're going to have raised walls. And I also have a little note there saying removed raised seating wall. And that arrow's pointing. We were going to have a, a length of a seating wall there as well. And same thing as the rear of the building, we were going to replace that with two benches as well, location to be determined. Because we are, it is going to be on the bus stop, and there will be people that need to stand outside, so we wanted to have that seating available. So we were that we just decided to do the two benches, as well as in the front vestibule, we'll have some seating on rainy days. If people need to wait for a ride, we'll have seats inside the building as well. So that was our decision on that. And as far as item number three on the solar panels, I think it was just a payback issue. So. Mm -hmm. Well, those are the reasons why those items were included on the list. All right, and, and I would I would suggest that you know item number three, you know, there's clearly some changes coming to you know, energy policy all around, and I think as you know the community energy provider, I think it's important to not remove those and to potentially consider doing a more uh, uh, overt uh, presentation of the solar just to be a first adopter and to expose the community to that. You mentioned you know the seating for you know the bus stop. It'd be nice to have. You know, solar covering for the the seating for the bus stop. It'd be nice to have, you know, solar walkways to the parking that are covered. That type of thing. Can we? I'm not sure what the procedure is here, but I guess I would suggest for items one and two, I'd like to see some elevations and some, and some renderings to get some sense of how that changes the aesthetic. Okay. And for number three, I'd like to see some costs associated with actually developing some covered walkways for solar. So from here, I guess I'll, I'll let the board decide if they want to vote to table the item or if they want to make a vote. That's, I'll leave it up to you. Let me ask this. On, okay. on the photo of care, um, that's off the grid. That's uh, panels to hopefully supply some electric to our building. One percent. I was, I was you anticipating my question. I, what, what contribution would this $20,240 expenditure make to our power consumption I mean what what they how much of it how much of our use is going to be supplied by this panel it would be one percent I think it equates to about seven hundred dollars a year savings so the payback on it would be what maybe 30 years the calculations is about roughly 43 years and most warranties on solar panels run out between 20 and 25 years I guess that's the short term look at it if we're really moving towards solar and towards that idea of incorporating it into the design of the building um, doesn't that have a long-term benefit beyond just the energy is, is the question I see and I, I, I understand your point I guess when we were looking at the payback and cost reduction factors and that was why we selected that. As far as energy, I have to turn it over to electrical guys on that side. But um, that was just, I can give you our just our reasoning for why we decided to list it as a deduction. I guess, um, I don't know if this is the right time to do it, but it seems like it is because it's part of the building and part of the design. To consider um, maybe expanding it or, you know, maybe it's so small that it doesn't work out financially, but if it was just a little bit bigger, maybe there'd be some greater value. I mean, there's a break point where it could still make more of a contribution, be integrated into the design of the building. Mm -hmm. And we can look at those numbers. Okay. 
what is the cost of solar panels for each panel? This time, it, I'm sorry to interrupt. The, the size of these panels that we're taking out, how big are they and what's the cost per panel? Well, I don't know the dimensions off the top of my head, but they, GRW um, estimated the cost for each one was $15,000. Of course, when you get a deduction, you don't get the, you're always going to reduce the amount that they're going to credit you. So the reduction you see is a little over 20000 but GRW's estimate was 30000 So I would assume roughly $15,000 per panel. As far as dimensions, I don't, I, can't, I don't have no love to Well, I guess what I was trying to, yeah. trying to determine, are they, you know, the length or the width of the building, um, I, I don't remember from the, the diagrams how they were arrayed on the, on the top of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, were they the length of it or were they? No, I mean, it was a small section and we were going to put it on the top floor on the side of the building facing Flynn. So it wouldn't be visible to the public, but we'd get the most use out of it. So, yeah, I can get the drawing to you to actually see the. So if we were to try to come up with um, using solar that would really make an impact we would have to have a lot larger area of solar panels uh, at whatever the cost was per panel uh, that would significantly increase the cost to the building itself. Yeah, and I don't know if the more you buy quantity, the price goes down. I, I don't know those numbers, but I can determine that if you'd like. But I would assume yes. And I, and I guess the, the follow-up question then would be, There would have to be a significant number of increase in panels to significantly impact the amount of energy that would be generated. I mean, we were talking seven or so now that would generate 1%. Uh, so three, four, five times that number to even get it up to 5%. And the cost is still going to be greater and the period of time to, to pay for themselves to put those panels on the roof would still be 43 years or so well, is their I, expected life. And Ben, tell me if I'm wrong. I would say the payback would reduce, I assume, if we put more, would you say? It would, it would, it may reduce some. I don't think it's going to, I, I, I don't think at any point you're going to get the payback to be, you know, less than what the warranty period is. But so really what we're doing then is making a, a show effort that, oh, we're trying to be more focused on renewables, focused on renewables I guess, then really it's going to have a benefit. So really it would just be a show. It would not be for an actual cost savings or for, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but but really it would just be purely to say, oh, we've done something. Okay. I guess I would jump in there. I don't think that's our only benefit from doing something like solar. Not only does it, not only is it a demonstration project, um, but it also gets, you know, our, our it provides an educational opportunity for our employees and for the community. You know, as, as the power structure mix changes over the coming years and as the the requirements that are regulatory requirements that are coming down from the federal government change over the coming years more and more solar is going to be in that mix and getting in front of that and spreading out that infrastructure cost and that education effort um, is only in our benefit because we will be dealing with it at some time in the future and starting to get the public uh, acclimated to it starting to get our uh, employees acclimated to it is something we're going to be doing at some point anyway so earlier is better, I think. And then the other question I would have for Sh for Shermista is, have we looked at any uh, any federal dollars or any state dollars to offset the cost to the plant board for putting in the solar? No, we did not. And I guess one other thing, right now they're on the roof of the building, but if it was creating shade, um, creating an environment, maybe there's more benefit than, than just the power itself. Mm -hmm. If there's some way to look at that at this point, and yeah, we can look at whatever you need us to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the members who are on the board now, who were on the board previously, will remember that when we undertook this project, uh, we 
advertised for bids and uh, bids came in higher than, unfortunately, as so many times happens, bids came in higher than anticipated. The decision had to be made whether to go ahead and proceed with the project or not. So the decision was to go ahead and proceed with the project, but to direct the staff to find reasonable ways to reduce the uh, anticipated cost. And, and that's what the staff's been doing right along. And uh, these three items uh, constitute over $50,000 of cost reduction. We're not there yet, but it's, it's a step. And, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. It's been the planning. We told the staff to do this, and, and they're trying to do it. And well, that's, that's good. And we did, cost down. we did accept those other cost cutting. Yes, we did. But that's this, this is an additional fifty-one thousand. Well, so the thing about for it, the entire thing. thing about it is we have, we've hashed these things out for two years now, and, we, and uh, I was very much in favor of geothermal, and I thought that would be the way to go. And we uh, they they said we couldn't do it. And then we decided we could do it, but we did 120 borings. And you couldn't do it with 120, 120 uh, tubes. So we went back to a bore chiller, and uh, we felt like that was the most economical way to, way to handle it. We've tried these things. We've tried to be as environmental friendly as we can and energy efficient as we possibly can, provided it, it, uh, it's economically feasible. One other comment I would make about the six kilowatt um, They've got that marked as a $20,000 item. Um, right now, I think industry standard uh, off-the-shelf uh, PV costs are about a dollar a kilowatt, or about a dollar a watt, and installed costs are a little south, south of $3. And I think that's also what uh, Berea recently saw with the installation of their solar farm. So we could also probably look around and see better numbers than that. And I also think, I also know there's a lot of federal dollars out there, particularly from the USDA, directed towards 50, communities 50,000 50, or less to support such projects. So I think we could move forward with it with that additional cost to, um, and even expand it without significant additional cost to the, to the community. How much of a bolt on acquisition is this? Is this something that, that we can defer doing uh, until construction is much farther along and then make a decision? Or is this something that we need to decide Soon, I did ask that question for these three particular items, and they said these are some items we can defer. I would prefer, you know, an answer the sooner the better, but yes, these are items that we can defer probably for a cut, maybe a month. And there's a difference between item one and item two, deferral wise, and item three, right? Yes. I expect item one and two are a little more time critical than item three is. Mm -hmm. And they, they said that would probably be maybe a spring job, so. Mm -hmm. You know. And also, if we look at moving item three into walkway covers and, and bus stop covers, that makes that temporal connection with, with our current time less, right? So. I'm not very familiar with solar panels, but how are they affected by weather? Um, um, you know, are they susceptible to damage from hail, um, uh, wind? Um, you know, we that that area there in 74 was hit with, a, you know, significant tornado event. Uh, does the positioning of, of the solar panels um, open us up to, you know, the potential for uh, damage because of weather-related items or, or not? I, I don't know, uh, you know, is it a, I'm not sure what the surface of a solar panel is. Um, can it be damaged by, by hail, for example? Um, um, are they heated so that if we have a significant snowfall that you know they don't they don't collect the snow doesn't collect or our freeze doesn't collect on the panel how how does all that work well you know they are designed to be outside so well, exactly you know, they're rugged and they're meant to take up take you know take the elements from outside they're meant to take wind loads and there's you know design numbers for that you know i think the last the last array i looked at a few weeks ago was actually an on-roof array and those panels uh, weren't even physically attached to the roof. They simply sat on the roof. And because of the nature of, of the distance and the shape of the, of the panel structure, they uh, were rated to uh, uh, the, the local wind loads, which I think was 100 and something miles per hour. So. Mm -hmm. And have we had any research that tells us how effective solar is in Kentucky? 
as far as the number of bright, sunshiny days that receive the sunshine, or maybe that's not even a, a factor. I, I don't know. I don't have hard numbers on the effective on the efficacy in Kentucky, but there is some research out of Stanford that talks about what the energy mix is going to look like. They do it. They did a study for each state, and they did particularly also a study for Kentucky. And the study for Kentucky had uh, solar as a large component of that of that uh, eventual 2030, 2050 rain time frame uh, power mix. Also, we have a few. Um home locations that have solar panels, and they've had them up for three or four years, and um, they seem to be functioning fine. And they have had a significant impact on their heating electric bills and... Yes, um, Andy McDonald, he was on the um, Farmer's Market Solar and Farm Tour. Um, he said there was only one month since he had them installed, which I mentioned maybe three years ago. Um, that he had to actually buy power. Now he lives pretty conservatively, um, you know, small home, uh, limited needs, but um, he's found it to be very effective and has put energy back into the system. And then Berea has, has their solar set up, and I suspect they get more snow than we do, and it seems to be fine. They hadn't mentioned any problems with breakage or anything else. Okay, well, where are we? Do we have anybody who cares to make a motion? Uh, we've got three components to this uh, action item. <clears throat> uh, I move for approval of uh, action item number seven, uh, change order number three for the administration building for a deduction of $50,753. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Do we have any further discussion? Any discussion? For, for me, the p turning point on this is the cost with regard with relation to the benefit. And the one percent return is just is just not is just not economic. We talk about all the time about how we try to consider our customers and the fact that we have we have a notable number of very low income customers and they just have a hard time paying their electric and water and sewer. We told the staff to find ways to, to reduce the cost of this project, and, and they've done it, and uh, that's my view of it, and so I'm inclined to, to agree with the motion. Well, I would, you know, I, I think we don't know what the impact, of particularly item number three, would be financially because we've not explored what grant and low interest loan money is out there from the federal government, from the state government, so we don't let you know what the impact of that would be at this point. And I also think that strictly looking at it as um, a financial issue is not taking the broader view of, of our responsibility to the community, um, which I think is our charter as the board to do. Um, the there are some panels on the back of the city municipal building. As you park, look up and see them. Does anybody know how effective they've been? But I think that comes to, I don't think we have enough information in front of us to decide. Well, as Charmista pointed out, we could wait a month, another month, to consider the um, seating area and even longer to consider solar options and do a little more research, um, which would be, um, I think, a good long-term thing to consider. We're in a discussion phase. We have a motion, we have a second, we have a discussion. Any more discussion? One other question I might have, because uh, I don't know the answer. The uh, the new uh, state office building that's being built on the hill, has it got solar panels on it? It does not, but they do have solar panels in the parking lot for electric vehicles. How okay. many of those are in Frankfurt? Okay, this is um, the new um, building that they're putting on the yeah, Sour I'm, Boulevard. What I'm asking, how many electric cars do we have in Frankfurt? Oh. I'm not aware of that. I know. I'm not um, aware of any except in California. Oh, well, I have a neighbor who has one. And, uh, yeah. All electric. Um, yes. Oh, good. Well, it, I think there's some gas no, it's light, a but it's yes, it's a yeah, hybrid. Kind of but you know, you'd be able to plug it in. So, um, Nash Cox. And I believe the city of Frankfurt has some electric vehicles for some of their employees that you know for employee use. And the state definitely does because they're putting these electric solar panels in. Electric, yeah, solar panels. Now, 
the state in their new building doesn't have a vested interest in solar. It's being built as a private building and they're paying rent on it. Whereas here, um, we're an electric supplier. And if renewables are going to be part of the future, wouldn't we want to show that we're going to be part of the future? If it's economical. If it's economical. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree if it's economical. Well, then I think we should study it more. I would agree. Okay, any more discussion? Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, that discussion, any more discussion on the agenda item? Uh, we'll call it for the uh, results. Uh, call it by member or vote yes is to approve the change order number three for a deduction of 5753. Vote would be no, we do not approve the change order. Member Ludwig? Yes. Member Green? Yes. Member Kabrowski? Yes. Member Baldwin? No. No. Okay, motion carries. Next item is number eight, but that's been removed from the agenda. Uh, the wind screen agreement. Okay, number nine is an action item. It is uh, to consider award a bid invitation number 1610 for steel transmission poles to Wesco distribution in the amount of 24159 for the yeah, board. <laughs> staff prepared a bid invitation for steel uh, yeah. transmission poles yeah. invitation was sent to six vendors with four responses received. Um, after reviewing all bids, staff recommends awarding Wesco distribution in the amount of $24,159. Wesco was the lowest bidder and they met uh, specifications as well. These, pol these poles here would just be used to uh, replenish depleted inventory. Do uh, we have any questions for Mark? Were these budgeted items? No. Inventory no, is no, budgeted a little bit different. It's not okay. a direct line item. Yeah, so. okay. Understand. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, do we have a motion? I'll move that we approve um, uh, bid invitation number 1610 for steel transmission poles to West Coast for 24159. Vote yes is to approve it. Vote no be to not approve it. Mr. Chairman, you need a second. Please. I'll second. Sir. I'll second. Okay. We got a second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Vote yes we'll is to approve it. Vote no be to not approve it. Mm -hmm. Kathy? We got an idea that he's 50 back up to 70 feet, so we got the normal pool. Member Green? Yes. Member Pogrosky? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. Okay, so that's pretty Motion simple. carries. Yeah, uh, they don't have more. They're not going to turbines. Right. Action yeah. item. Nine Agenda item number 10 is an action item. Consider award of bid invitation 1611 for two pan boundary transformers to Cape Electrical in the amount of 13,972 and two pad boundary transformers to Wesco in the amount of 40,969. Four pad mount transformers. The invitation was sent to six vendors with five responses. Uh, after reviewing all bids, staff recommends awarding to Cape Electrical and Wesco as they were the lowest bids meeting uh, specification. Language in this bid allows us to divide the bid for the best price for the plant board. And uh, so the recommendations are as follows Item one would go to Cape Electric for $6,259. Item two would go to Cape Electrical for $7,713. Items three and four would go to Wesco for $15,209 and $25,760 respectively. Uh, these transformers are the same as the steel poles, they're just uh, replenishing inventory. Okay. Right, motion. I move that we approve bid invitation 1611 for two pan boundary transformers to Cape Electrical in the amount of $13,972. <coughs> Two pad mounted transformers to Wesco in the amount of forty thousand nine sixty nine. We have a second. Second. Discussion. Mark, you would think that uh, uh, these people would, that provide us these transformers uh, would have almost the identical price structure. <clears throat> they do, apparently they don't. But you would think that one company would like to deal with us and give us all the all the pad transformers instead of having. Two different companies do it. If you 
thing. <laughs> you think? But we don't really bid on a blanket style uh, bid like that with these things. Cause we just don't know what we're going to use. It's from year to year. We might use four or five one year and none the next. So it doesn't behoove them to, to get this very good price if we did that. So. Okay, anything else? Uh, if not, uh, vote yes is to approve the uh, bid invitation. Vote no, be denied. Okay, Kathy? Yes. 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 Okay, motion carries. Uh, agenda item number 11 is an action item. Consider acceptance of Parrot Company Inc.'s proposal to repair the service center roof at 305 Hickory Drive in the amount of $73,100. Uh, Chairman, Board, uh, the weight of last winter's heavy snowfalls uh, damaged the roof purlins at the FPV Service Center. Uh, this structure was built in 1968 and it still has the original uh, metal roof on it. Uh, we did re uh, attempt several repairs um, with uh, no success at all and we continue with numerous leaks in the uh, front portion of the building. Staff prepared a proposal or a request for proposal in July of 2015 and uh, sent that out to five uh, different roofing contractors with no responses. Um, so again, in August, <laughs> we sent another one out. Uh, we sent it to uh, 10 different roofing contractors to still with no success or no responses back. Um, so the bid process had been completed twice with uh, unsatisfactory results and so therefore, we investigated, discussed with the staff attorney, and it was determined the next appropriate step would be to uh, negotiate with the contractor. Uh, we contacted the Harriet Company. Uh, they have, uh, they're a general contractor, and they have done successful work, good work for us in the past on different projects. And uh, so we asked them to provide us with a proposal. Um, the proposal uh, was submitted, and it found acceptable for $72,100. Um, with winter approaching, we'd really like to get this done as quickly as possible. <laughs> and uh, funds are included in the support services budget this year. I'd like to be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we accept uh, a proposal from Hendrick and Company to repair the roof at the service center, 305 Hickory Drive, in the amount of $70,100. I'll second the motion. Discussion. Have we seen the work done by this company on any other buildings? Yes, some of our own buildings. We've, we've okay. used them before. Um, I believe the water treatment. water treatment plant, they've done some work. It's been good to work with. Okay. Sounds good. Anything further for Mark? Uh, if not, uh, vote yes be to approve the expenditure. Or vote no be to not. Yeah. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Agenda item number 12, an action item. <clears throat> Consider executing contract with Gannett Fleming Inc. to conduct a water cost of service and rate design study for a cost not to exceed $25,000. The last water cost of service study that was utilized to adjust the retail water rates was performed by the same firm, Gannett Fleming, in 2013. The goal of staff is to conduct a cost of service study every two years to ensure our revenue requirements are being properly addressed. Over the next few years, the Water Department's capital funding requirements will increase due to additional borrowing for the reservoir and other capital projects. As a result, the cost of service study this year is prudent. As a matter of course, Gannett Fleming has provided a proposal for a cost of service study not to exceed $25,000. The proposal and the contract are included in the detail and have been forwarded to the staff attorney for his review. The Water Department budgeted $25,000 in this year's budget for the work. Staff recommends the board approve the contract with Gannett Fleming for a cost not to exceed $25,000. I'll be happy to answer any questions this time. Questions for Dave? We have a motion. I move that we uh, consider executing a contract with uh, Gannett Fleming to conduct a cost of water uh, service and rate design study, the cost not to exceed $25,000. Second. 
Anybody? Second, yeah. We have a motion, we have a second to approve uh, uh, discussions. Yes, water cost studies is all this just, uh, it's just one of these things that come along with being in this business. It's a necessary outlay. Uh, vote yes is to approve the uh, cost of service study. Uh, vote no would be to not approve it. Kathy. Member Lovett? Yes. Yes. Member Pogrodsky? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, moving right along here. Uh, number 13 is an action item. Consider approval of the agreement between the Electric and Water Plant <coughs> Board of the City of Frankfort, Kentucky and the City of Frankfort, November 4, 2015, in the amount of $80,000 a year to lease the downtown building and in the amount of 109000 per year for the use of city facilities. Do, uh, do we have any staff going to make any comments on this? It, uh, it was arranged with the, the city had, a, uh, had come out with a plan to uh, have a license fee for each time the plant board were, were to use city uh, you know, cut up cut a ditch for a, for a pipe or a conduit and have a license fee associated with each individual each individual operation. Instead of doing that, James had worked out an agreement with, uh, with Rob Moore and, uh, and Rob Moore working with the commissioners to come up with sort of a, sort of a flat fee for a better term to, uh, to pay, pay sort of one fee per year instead of going back. It's kind of administratively more efficient to just pay one time and then get access to the to the city facilities to run wires and conduit and so forth. And that's what the what the agreement basically the essence of the agreement is. So just some staff would ask that the board move to approve the agreement. This is something we've been working on for some time. I know <coughs> long standing board members are familiar with and I discussed it somewhat with our newer members. There were several issues hanging out there. Some with the city had some claims and we had some as well and this reduces it all to writing and You'll see it includes a release of any old claims by either party. And of course the rent, it formalizes the rent where the plant board uses the space in the municipal building. Of course when the plant board moves out that uh, rent would terminate. But uh, it will have to be formally approved. If it's approved by this board, it will also have to be approved by the city commission. But I believe that it will be if this board sees fit to approve it. Uh, members? Questions for hands, James. If not, uh, I'll move that this board uh, approve the agreement between the city and the electric water plant board uh, for rent in the amount of eighty thousand dollars a year for lease of the downtown building, in the amount of one hundred nine thousand dollars a year for the use of city facilities, as presented in the packet in the proposed agreement. Second. Second. <coughs> we have a motion. We have a second. Discussion. The, um, vote yes is to approve the agreement. So, so the city. Vote no be to not approve. Yeah. Member Ludwig? Yes. Member Green? Yes. Member Pogotsky? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. And motion carries. So now if the city will approve it, why that extremely important item of business will be packed away. Agenda item number 14 is an action item. Consider approving public hearing notice covering one, increasing rate for classic cable service, two, reducing rate for preferred cable, and three, increasing rate for bulk cable one and two, and four, increasing rate for premium channel services. John Harvey. I'll start and then hand off to Harvey if that's okay with you, yes, Mr. Chairman. Over the last several years, uh, it's, uh, the staff and board has worked together as increases come in our programming agreements to uh, construct a, a straight pass through of those increased fees onto our customers. And really, we come to tonight with really with no difference in, in the way that we've been doing that for several years now. 
staff brings to the board every few years uh, new agreements. Sometimes they're as short as three years and sometimes as long as seven years as far as the term is concerned for the programming agreements. And built into each one of those agreements are increases for the license fees, typically on a calendar year basis. That's why we typically do this type of public hearing toward the end of a calendar year and in preparation for the rates as they go up by the contracts that we have at the beginning of the next uh, calendar year. Sometimes we have renewals uh, that come right at the end of the year. They're not always on a calendar year basis, but the majority of them are. This year it's a little different in that we have two of our bigger agreements that their term ends here at the end of the calendar year and we have another one that, that ends in February of 2016. The staff believes there are, we're in really pretty good shape as far as the budget is concerned on what we think these new increases will be on NBC Universal and on Turner Networks. That's the, NBC is in uh, December, the term is up in December and Turner Networks is at the end of February. The one we didn't uh, really have a great idea on exactly how much the increases would be would be on AMC Networks. And uh, the way that we budgeted for AMC Network increases was somewhere about 40 or 50 percent, which is a pretty significant increase. But as we, uh, as we sit here today, and the deal that's, that's still being negotiated, uh, we haven't seen much movement over the course of the last three or four weeks on that deal is, a, is an increase as much as uh, three or four hundred percent. Uh, so we budgeted for about a five or for a five dollar rate increase. We come to you tonight with a maximum of six dollars and thirty five cents. The difference, the vast majority of that difference really being on the AMC networks uh, uh, increase being substantially more than than we had anticipated and budgeted. I'm going to let Harvey get into the to the nuts and bolts of uh, all four of these different areas and we'd be happy to to uh, to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, John. Uh, the NCTC is currently negoti in negotiations with AMC. Uh, there has been some slight movement on the financial terms, uh, not much recently. But the area in which AMC has really refused to negotiate at all is distribution. Uh, AMC Networks owns six different uh, cable channels. Currently, we offer AMC on Classic Cable, and we offer IFC, WeTV, and BBC America on Preferred Cable. AMC Networks is demanding that we move the Preferred Cable channels to Classic Cable, in which case we begin to pass on that expense to more subscribers, as well as launching two other brand new channels that they own, Sundance Channel and BBC World News, uh, and those would be required launches on Classic Cable as well. Uh, the the three preferred channels are uh, lightly viewed, and the two brand new channels have not been requested by our customers. Uh, the consistent message that staff has heard from our customers over the years is that they want to be able to choose what channels they receive, uh, and staff feels that AMC's demands go straight in the face of that. Not only do they want FPV to launch two new channels, they want all of our cable customers to pay for all six of their channels, whether they want them or not. Uh, FPV staff and operators from other NCTC members have communicated to AMC that we are willing to pay a fair increase on AMC and also maintain existing distribution for their other channels. AMC has made it clear that the distribution terms on this deal are going to be an all or nothing situation. Uh, we plan to bring the AMC Network's agreement to the board for their consideration at the regular December meeting. Uh, if the board decides not to renew the AMC Network agreement, staff would recommend a reduction of this cable rate increase at that time. So as such, staff recommends the, the board approve a public hearing and a special meeting on December 1st at 5 p.m. covering the following increases and decreases, which would be effective on January 1st of 2016. That would be increasing classic cable from 5450 to 6085, reducing preferred cable from 1150 to 1050, increasing rates for bulk cable one from $7 to 1110, Increasing rates for bulk cable two from 1735 to 1935, uh, and increasing rates for premium channel services, increasing HBO from $19 to $20 per month, and increasing all other premium channel services from $14.50 per month to $15 per month. Again, all of these increases are driven solely by increased programming expenses. Uh, and John and I would be happy to answer any questions you guys may have uh, about this item. Now, Harvey, do I understand you say that the proposed increases, especially in this classic 
$60.85. That assumes that we renew AMC. Yes, sir. And what programs, what, what networks are the AMC again? For the uh, AMC, the, the, the channels that we currently carry are, are AMC network, uh, which is channel 54 on classic cable, IFC, WeTV, and BBC America on preferred cable, and then these two additional channels, which FPB does not currently carry, Sundance Channel and BBC World News. From time to time, we've done uh, surveys to determine how popular our programming is at different channels. Has there been anything done in that regard lately that would give us any indication of the popularity of these <coughs> channels? The last uh, public survey that we did was um, at the, uh, when we did our last retrans pass, I think, which would have been in a year ago. Uh, okay. Yeah, a year. And, and, and for us, the, the way that we're measuring is really through uh, viewership data that we're able to collect on a uh, little more than half, a little more than half of our of our customer base has an yes. advanced set top yes. box capable of of delivering to us viewership information. This AMC, some of its popular programming has been just Walking Dead, something else. But it's their. But those it's, programs, those particular programs, are, are concluded, are they not? Those series. Uh, the current season of, of Walking Dead, I think there's two or three more episodes, and then they'll take a break, and then they're going to finish the season in the spring. And, I mean, I don't think they've announced whether they're going to do another season or not after that. I imagine with the success that it's had that they'll continue to run that as long as they can run it. But there was something else that was very popular. They recently, uh, Mad Men and Breaking Mad Bad okay. were two channels, that, two programs that were on AMC that have both concluded uh, in the last 18 months. So the decision the board will have to make, not tonight, but the decision the board will have to make is whether or not we're going to renew AMC. So that's, right? that's the major driving force on, okay. on this right now, yeah. But you're here tonight to ask us to set a public hearing for December 1, so correct, right. on these proposed rate increases. Right. What would happen if we just dropped it? Would our customers be really upset? Or? I would say it would be fair to say that there would be a small percentage of our customers that are, that's that's their favorite program on Walking Dead as an example. And so yeah, there would be a, a percentage of customers that would be unhappy with us. Uh, there are other avenues to get the programming. Uh, it is available the following day on, it's really more Harvey's area than mine, but it, it's available the next day on iTunes. iTunes and Amazon, Amazon and Google Play. You can. By the, by the episodes on like the Like $1.99 or something like that is what it is. There are two episodes remaining for this uh, calendar year. They take a break until mid to late February, and then they'll have their last eight episodes is how it's set up. And then there is no word yet today whether they'll have a, you know, a new season come next fall. Um, the probability is that they, that they will because it's still so, so highly rated in, in AMC. Or, they're smart guys and girls over there that they're going to squeeze every dollar out of that franchise that they can. They've even really spun it off into another one. So uh, they, they will air those as long as people are watching. Well, have we done it in the past, and would it have any effect if we said to the public, look, this is what they're doing with their contract, um, and they're requiring 10 years? Is that yeah, that's the other. That's Those are the things that, that Harvey touched on a moment ago, was that you know, we're used to three, five, and seven-year agreements. The sports folks, the ESPNs of the world really are the, the, the longer ones because they have to sign longer deals with the National Football League or National Basketball Association, that kind of thing. So they, they're they tied up that long and in turn they tie us up that long. Uh, but uh, we're not used to seeing a 10-year agreement. I can't remember the last time that we brought one to this board. To answer your other question, yes, this, uh, previous boards have dropped programming in the past. Uh, oh, man, we, we presented to the public the question about how we're kind of being held. Actually, this is, our, this is our first uh, communication in public. And as, a, as an organization of the National Cable Television Cooperative, it's only in, over the course of the last couple of days that other cable operators have stepped out in public. And really what the impetus has been, has been that a AMC has started to run crawls on the bottom of the screen during the Talking Dead 
uh, alerting customers of uh, that that particular cable uh, company is is looking to drop the channel, and it's a in some ways a scare tactic to get that that subscriber to call in to that cable company. Now, that hasn't happened to Frankfurt Plant Board yet. Uh, but there's 700 or so members uh, representing nearly 5 million subscribers for those net for those channels. They're all uh, being asked to uh, consider the same uh, deal. Uh, AMC. I was in a meeting two weeks ago. Uh, as a, I'm a member of the board of the NCTC, and and they flew in the negotiating team from AMC, and we sat in a, in a room with them for an hour and a half seven different operators that serve Alaska, California, Kansas, Texas, Ohio, Kentucky, a little bit everywhere. Really big cable companies, really small cable companies, and we are one of the bigger in there. We're not that great, we're not that big. Um, and AMC's arguments were down to really two things. The big cable companies, the very big cable companies had already signed the deal. And if they can sign it, so will everybody else. The other thing is, they said that they had over-delivered with uh, viewership for Mad Men and Breaking Bad over the course of the last three or four years. And though those two series had had their run and they, they were no longer being produced, new ones, uh, we now needed to pay for that success going forward. So that's an interesting negotiating tactic. but. Uh, to our customers, this is our first public communication about it, and it'll be, we'll, we'll have quite a bit more, I'm sure, once Seth writes something in the newspaper tomorrow, and this is on cable 10 tomorrow night. So we're prepared to uh, talk with our customers about it, but we hope they understand it's not just about one program. It's about what we think is a fair and equitable deal uh, for their more popular network in AMC, and we as a, as a cable company and our and our fellow uh, members within a co-op, uh, we'd like to continue to um, allow customer choice on the additional five networks. And if you want them, then you should pay for them. And if you don't want them or your customers don't want them, then you shouldn't be forced to carry them. And uh, that, that scenario has worked for more than 20 years with, uh, with the deals we've had in place with AMC. And, and we think it's fair to continue to ask for those type of, uh, those type of deals. AMC doesn't see it that way. Uh, the last time we got an update was at 3.30 today and there was no change. So our, our deal was through the end of the year and uh, we would need to make some sort of, we will come back to you in mid-December at the regular meeting with whatever deal is available to us because they will negotiate a deal. Uh, we'll just have to decide as a, as a community whether it's uh, the right deal for us. And we get to tell the, the um contract isn't secret we can tell the public everything we can't we we are there are confidentiality pieces within the agreement on the actual license fee okay and uh but the the term deals i think we pretty well established <coughs> it's an all or nothing all six or you get none it's a 10 year and um i'm leaving something out well I mean, we generally talk in percentage increases yeah so we're not specific dollars and cents uh, and we've done that in the past and and so where we are today versus where this deal sits today, the percentage increase is to our customers. I can't remember the exact number. Now. It was around 400%. About 400%. On, cla on classic cable. On classic cable, just to be clear. So we'll give you more info as we get it. Um, don't hold your breath on too many changes, but we'll see what happens over the course of the next four weeks. So what other plans are there beyond the newspaper article and this public hearing to start educating the public and start soliciting feedback? Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few things that, that uh, we work together with our, uh, with our cooperative that are made available to all, our, all members, uh, social media, uh, some Cable 10 shows, I'm sure. Um, there, there's actually a branded website, tvonmyside.com, which we, we used uh, during the Viacom renewals uh, a year and a half ago. and to that the NCTC's membership has, has come together and uh, to, to get our message out and, and it's been really successful in, um, in getting our story out and so we'll continue to use that and, um, and yell as loud as we can from the outlets. Are there any, have. any efforts to actually pull information from the public? Are we doing any more on surveys or is there any Well, that site actually does, does solicit, um, okay. you know, email uh, collection, so to speak, and um, 
So, but as far as the, I mean, this is the first time we've talked about it, and uh, as far as the customer survey goes, um, you know, I don't know that we have that planned, or but you know, we can certainly anything's. But we're at a point where we'll be making an up-down decision on the next board meeting on the 15th, right? Uh, pro probably. Yeah, that, that's not to say that last-minute extension of four weeks, six weeks, it's happened in the past. But probably. Yeah, I'm not. So I guess along that lines, any solicitation information we'd have to get on now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we really, uh, yeah, we really need to start talking about it more, and we've and really, this is our first opportunity. Well, and, and, and to be honest, I think we expected that we would have been subject to the crawls. Just, they started about two weeks ago, and so we thought that that would be the start of the conversation, and we could start defense at that point, and they haven't happened. And so this is the first opportunity that we've had to talk. I think it's good to be proactive. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah we've, in, in a way, we're really surprised that they haven't crawled us yet. And, uh, and so we... Yeah, we have to be on the offensive at this point and, and tell the story, especially with its impact on the on the uh, on the rate increase. Anyway, it's a it's a key to it. Well, all we're doing right now is making a, a motion to yes. uh, hold a public hearing. <laughs> yes, sir. That's it. Uh, increase the rate for classic cable, reduce the rate for preferred cable, increase the rate for bulk cable one and two, and increase the rate for premium channel services. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's your motion? Yes, sir. A second. And that's for December 1st? Yes, sir. Correct. Yes, sir. So we have a motion to set the public hearing on these topics for December 1st. Do we have a, we have a second for this discussion? Um, well, I just looked at the number of business days. That's only seven business days between now and December 1st, so um, just to be prepared, I guess. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, what's the rule on the, on the public hearing? Is it it's at 7 and 21? It can be no sooner than 7. It can be no longer than 21 days. Oh, okay. uh, we have also a 30-day uh, federal rule on notification to our customers. We have to give them a 30-day notice if there's a change of rate, so we've got one extra day to play with on December 31st. It's tight. But yeah, it's okay. very tight, and yeah. you folks are typically available on Tuesday, so that's why we pick Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't give us a lot of room to negotiate here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, vote yes is to uh, set the public hearing December 1, and uh, that'd be, what, 5 o'clock? Five o'clock. Five p.m. Yes, sir. Five p.m. Uh, in this vote, room. Vote no, to do not have. Would <coughs> you call the roll, please? Member Ludwig. Yes. Member Green. Yes. Member Pogratsky. Yes. Member Baldwin. Yes. Member Rosen. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Everybody, talk to the friends and neighbors and find out whether they want to carry the AMC channels. We're down to, I think we can go ahead and push on without a break unless somebody feels like they need a break or want a break. We'll try to back it away here shortly. Um, agenda item number uh, 15 is an action item to consider the establishment of a committee for the development of recommendations to improve communications by FPB to the community. I can speak to that some. I gave uh, the rest of the board members and staff uh, just a brief summary to write up. But the general idea is to have to expand our communications with the public by making the board more accessible, soliciting feedback, and also telling our story more about what the uh, what our major projects and initiatives are that are in flight. Um, initial suggestions would be a list of board members with a comment form that's central. That's not a direct email contact, con contact, but. Uh, Marshall's uh, comment form that gets aggregated and presented up to the board. We also have you know, a central place for meeting minutes and agendas and video linked in a way that it can be searched. And I would make a motion that um, we accept and um, direct staff to make those changes on the website. You're asking to establish a committee, is that right, for the development? Right? Mm -hmm. Are you proposing a specific committee? Or? 
been committee to be comprised of what board members and staff or do you have any idea? I guess the committee language I didn't notice. <laughs> but um, this wasn't as formal as much as I these simple things. I'm comfortable doing a committee as well. If you want to have a committee uh, uh, populated by staff and board members and liaison, I think that's fine. So the first step then would be to establish a committee to to uh, study this subject and to come up with some proposals. Sure. Okay. So this committee could be comprised of one or more board members and, and presumably uh, appropriate staff members. Motion. That's my motion. Thank you. I you second. Second. I'll second it. Okay. okay. Any discussion? Now, how was it, how was it worded again? I didn't quite catch it. Establish a committee. Just establish a committee. Just establish a committee. Yeah. So to work with the staff to come I got, up with a I got that. specific. Okay. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, any more discussion? I think the objective is is, is great. Really, I mean, you really, you always need to improve communications with, with your community when you're a municipal corporation. Uh, you need to do that. So. Ready for a vote on this? We'll call it by member. Vote yes is to, uh, Establish a committee, and Mr. Baldwin will be the, be the person to try to be the spark plug and try to pull that together. Yes, sure. Vote no, we do not establish. <coughs> Member Ludwig? Yes. Member Green? Yes. Member Pogorski? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. Yes, uh, motion carries unanimously. Uh, next uh, item is uh, also an action item. It's uh, posted as, define a plan to consider the customer service experience at the new administration building. And I think a more appropriate uh, labeling of this would be to establish a committee to consider ways to improve the, the customer service experience at the uh, new admin building. And the thought behind this was, you know, we're, we're, we have a really unique opportunity here with, with the construction of this new public or the new admin building to improve service to be a big a better community steward and I think we need to you know do our due diligence to make sure we're you know considering all the things we could do to make the, to improve our customer experience as much as possible you know it's just, I think everybody it's, it's clear the, the limitations we've got in our, our current space it's important for us to make sure that we develop a new space as, as well as we can and I think we can do that by physical um, features of the building, addressing workflow, addressing customer experience, general feel, but we could also do it with policy changes, you know, trying to spread, you know, the flow of customers across the month by, um, you know, staggered bill pay, maybe even potentially prepay, and then also just to limit the number of folks that actually even come to the, the admin building to, to pay their bill by accepting credit cards in person, on the phone, and on the web, and, and reduce and reduce the rates for that. And in, and in particular with the, the credit card discussion, um, I had a discussion with um, the COO of one of the larger uh, international, North America anyway, Canada and uh, uh, America, credit card processors last week and they indicated that um, it's very straightforward for us to get credit card transaction fees in the 0.7 to 1% range which would be dramatically less than what we have now with the 395 I believe we paid to Western Union and would encourage folks to use credit cards and, and simplify that payment process and reduce the load on the admin building significantly. So I guess to summarize, I'm suggesting we develop a committee to study the ways that we can, through policy and through physical aspects of the building, uh, improve our customer service experience and provide the best customer service experience that we can. So it's a, it's a committee that would be dealing with a wide range of, of subjects, really. <coughs> uh, I would have some concern about how much uh, 
potential changes might be proposed as to the the building itself at this stage. Uh, there's been a lot of planning that's gone into the layout out there, and and uh, and uh, staff is comfortable with it. And the board's been comfortable with it, and. And that would be one concern that I would have would, would be to the extent to which we would, would uh, be attempting to change uh, yeah. the, well, uh, um, the building itself. And I think it has been looked at very, very thoroughly, but um, perhaps mainly from the standpoint of the employees and not so much the customers. Having the uh, police officer in the lobby, um, the congestion, um, waiting in line because we don't have staggered billing. Um, those things are causing frustrations with the customers, and I don't know that we've looked at their perspective as much as the employee perspective. Well, I think we should do that. I agree with that. Uh, what I don't want to do is get into putting a hold on to how we build the interior of that uh, customer service area because that opens up a whole range of problems and planning and costs. And I think we have. I think we have a time range where we can, you know, make some suggestions and 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 deal with that and I think that would be the goal of you know the first meeting whether we call a special meeting to have a public conversation or whether we have a, a committee that does it that we would set out you know what those time frames are and get the most time sensitive items at the front of the discussion so we can move on those as quickly as we can. So uh, the motion then again is to establish a committee to consider customer service experience at the new administration building. Yes. But that's not to be limited to just the policy things. That's also the physical space. Well, you know, one thing we hired an architect for is to do a walk through study, walk through study, mm -hmm. and and a flow of a, of our customers sure. and how they're going to how we're going to maintain the flow and not have the congestion. And I don't think we will have. But I mean, I, I feel like that that those people are so, certainly more knowledgeable than we can come up with. And that's why we hired an architect to do these things. Sure. And from my discussions with the architect and with staff, there was a great deal of consideration about the employee part of that equation, but not any significant consideration of the customer part of that. Of that. I don't know. Can you well, I think it's looking at kind of from the standpoint of um, that if you have a particular type of environment, people react one way versus another way. So um, if they walked into a stark room, um, felt depressed. And well, it's going to have lighting. The lighting in the a building. Extreme everything that we're, do, that we're doing in the building is for is for is for customer benefit, not particularly for staff. Board votes to establish this committee. It might we might just do a briefing with the two new board members and explain what we, what considerations for the customer side we did because the probably the highest it, the one of the highest priorities, if not the top, was the whole customer service experience. So we did have a thorough discussions about just as a customer, just from when they walk into the building, what they're going to see, how they'll which direction they'll go with the experiences when they meet with the cashier and that may be something when we if we the committee's established we just sit at the floor plan and look at what we considered as far as the customer side as well and I understand you're talking about surveys and talking to them but we can go over you know the customer side as well what we what we discussed and incorporated into the design and the informational aspect is good as well but, um, I believe the quote was, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about our side of the glass and not any time thinking about the other side of the glass. Yeah. And I want to make some make sure we're thinking about the other side of the glass. And yeah, when we discuss that, we can share that too. Well, maybe, maybe the answer is for Anne Marie and Walt to meet with you and, and other appropriate parties, JRW, whoever, and explore these. Subjects with them as far as the building topic is concerned. And I believe I have already at this point spoken to the architect of GRW and have also spoken to staff. And so I would still submit that we should have a committee and start considering how we can improve the customer service experience. I guess I'm a little confused. Um, I think we all realize the issues that are present currently 
in our customer service area. They're cramped, uh, they're uh, not convenient for someone who's waiting for a service, uh, there's not um, adequate, comfortable seating. Uh, there is a police officer in the lobby and that's for, uh, for security reasons. I think we took those considerations um, into account when we devised the workflow plan for this new administration building. My question would be, have you uncovered specific issues with the design as it currently is uh, in the, the month or so that you've been on the board uh, to come up to see that there are are things that we overlooked or things that uh, we didn't take into consideration, I guess is. I think a little bit. I think that, um, you know, I think the, the, the point about security, I think, is well taken. And I think it's important that, you know, given the poor security environment that we clearly have for the customer and the employee at the current admin building, I think it's important that we don't overcorrect and build a hardened facility that then becomes an escalator to customer tensions instead of a de-escalator to customer tensions. And I think significant, some significant amounts of bulletproof glass and floor to ceiling barriers are very high barriers to uh, the customer, doesn't generate an engaging experience for the customer. I think that highly elevated desks pr producing a domineering experience from the customer's perspective from the CSR isn't necessarily the best way for us to go to build a relationship with the customer. And then on the policy side, you know, we can reduce a lot of these flows and reduce a lot of these tensions from not having this huge burst of, of folks that move into the into the center on, on particular days for cutoff or bill pay or those types of events. We get high flow, and you know, for instance, of, of a thing we missed, there's no reason we can't accept credit cards in in the in the in person at the counter. There's no reason we have to pay those kinds of fees, these kinds of rates. I believe the quote from. Uh, the gentleman I spoke to at the credit card processing plant or credit card processing company was that municipal utilities are um, get the best rates of any vendor in our portfolio, and again, you know, they're 0.7 to 1, 0.7 to 1 percent, and that's a low enough rate that we could consider not even passing that rate through to the customer because of the benefit it gets us to not have that traffic inside the customer service building. Well, I think I could agree. Um to having a committee uh, to establish uh, procedures to look at policy. Uh, I don't think that I could agree uh, to significant changes in the design and layout of the customer service area uh, that we have spent time and effort already doing. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we're talking about significant changes, but. I mean, I think that's, I think that's almost the point of reinventing the wheel uh, when it's not necessary. Uh, I'm totally in agreement with, um, you know, policy changes, looking at credit cards. I know that was an issue when I first came on the board about uh, credit card acceptance. Um, and so, you know, I would be more than happy to, to relook at that. But, um, you know, there were uh, previous boards that uh, have discussed and looked at planning and made decisions that I don't think because we've had a change in board that we ought to go back and relook at how we do everything, um, my opinion. But I, I think that we can be positive and, and increase the customer experience. Um, uh, I, I think maybe uh, a staggered billing or prepay, all those items that you have listed here are worthy of looking at. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, we've we started construction uh, and, you know, if if we start reevaluating every decision that was made prior to construction beginning, I think it's, I think it's undue burden, so. Well, I think um, after we reviewed the new plans, I went over to the courthouse and looked at their layout with um, they have large pieces of glass with six inch slits and asked them about how that worked for them. And they said um, they were very dissatisfied that um, the counter is up very high so customers are looking up to them kind of like God. Um, it's difficult for 
customers to hear them because elderly people can't hear well, the glass is in the way. The maintenance of the glass, it always looks messy, sticky, fingerprints, um, and that they weren't consulted when it was put in, which we did consult with people here, um, so I think that's good. But I think that it does set up a barrier where um, I'm not convinced that if we solve some of these other problems that we would still need to have a glass barrier. Well, oh, if, if, you, if, you, if you talk to the people at First Federal, they came in there with a gun on two occasions. Is First Federal downtown? I think you'll see that they have a reason to have bulletproof glass and that you have to be uh, let in if they know who you are. Ms. Rosen, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about the courthouse uh, mm -hmm. because we discussed that in, in the right. meeting that we had together and it intrigued me. Mm -hmm. uh, last Thursday, I had to go get my driver's license removed. Okay. And so I'm staying there, taking my little photo, getting that done. And so I asked the, the lady that was behind the counter, I said, this is great glass. What do you think about your, your customer service window here? And they said, we'd love it. The only issue we have with it is that the glass is too far away from us, and so there's no room on the customer side to set the clipboard or whatever um, documents they have to write on. You he mean said, the employee side? The, no, on oh, the, on the customer, customer side. side. Oh, there's okay. only about a six-inch ledge. Okay. They said the only issue we have with it is there's no room for the customer to do their work. Uh, they said other than that, we are happy to have a, a protective barrier, uh, that may not be the exact word that she used, between us. But she said they had no problem communicating, uh, but the, the issue to them was the, the space between where they sit and the distance to the glass, they said it's, it's dead space. You know, stuff falls back behind the computers. Uh, you know, it's hard for them to get to. But as far as customer uh, service, they didn't have, let me tell you about, the lady I was talking to said she didn't have an issue with it. Okay. But I was glad you brought that up because that was that was a, an intriguing question for me to ask when I went over there. I would have had no reason to go over there any other reason, but uh, I thought I would take that opportunity to ask. Uh, uh, and I didn't ask the other lady that was there. But okay. So I think there are some, uh, some, you know, some, some issues that could be there, but I, I don't think that safety should be outweighed over, uh, over other issues. So, again, I'm, I'm happy with considering a committee to look at policy. Uh, I'm not willing um, to look at a committee form to make changes to the existing uh, layout of the customer service area. Sure, Mr. Just taking that specific example of the glass and those components of the CSR stations, where does that fall in the project plan and what kind of timing would we have to address any changes we might have there? That does require some lead time. They've actually already submitted the shop drawings to the architect and based on our conversations, I've asked them to hold on that approval. So they're basically waiting for the okay for me to approve those shop drawings because some of the lead time on the glass is 30 to 60 days. And when, when is the actual installation plan? Probably spring. Okay, so we've got a few months before we'd have to do anything. It's just you have to take into consideration the lead time to sure. construct it. So. Okay, so where are we? Are you, are you in the main motion? Yes, I would still. Second. Yes, I second it. Yeah. And that was uh, fairly broad. That was for the broader mm -hmm. uh, to look committee at to look at everything. Look at everything. Mm -hmm. So. Unless there's any more discussion, I think we should vote on that and see where we go from there. Okay. Vote yes would be to approve the uh, motion by Mr. Paul. Paul, excuse me. <laughs> Senior moment. Okay. Vote no would be to not approve. Member Ludwig? Uh, no. Member Green? No. Member Pogratsky? No. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosen? Yes. Okay, uh, the motion does not carry. Um, so, I have a question. Does that mean we shouldn't consider reducing the cost of using credit cards? Okay, we should not vote. 
reduce the cost of using credit cards? Well, I would look at that, but that's something we've looked at before. There's no reason why we can't look at that at any time. Uh, okay. We've looked at the problem with the credit cards has been, I understand that there's uh, whatever the amount is, three or four dollars, and it's it, and it's paid by the customer. And the alternative is that the plant board would have to carry it, bear that cost, a much and, and that's amount. not fair to other customers. But but, much more but Mr. Baldwin is telling us that there's maybe another option, so we need to look at that. So can I make a motion that we have a committee form to look at improvements to customer service, the policy issues? And so you already got a committee for that, haven't you? Mm -hmm. No, we didn't. Mm -hmm. We just voted against it. It was all up together. Oh, it was. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're back to ground zero now. Right. And, and, and what you're proposing is along the lines of what uh, Rick indicated that he his thinking is. So if one of you would make a motion, we'll yes. see where that goes. I'd like to make a motion that we set up a committee to look at customer service policies, including the four things listed there, but credit cards, um, prepaid, staggered billing, other things that may tie into policy. I would second that. Okay, discussion? Uh, this committee would be what? Uh, uh, one or more board members and one or more staff? And, and uh, who's yes. going to be the spark plug from, from the board? Take the leadership role. Okay, the person. Okay. Um, any more discussion on this? If not, we'll take it by a member of vote yes is to approve that uh, motion. Uh, establish that committee for policy value uh, examination. Vote no would be to not do so. Member Ludwig? Yes. Member Green? Yes. Member Pogrodsky? Yes. Member Baldwin? Yes. Member Rosa? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Number 17 is old new business. Uh, any old new business? Uh, old and new business? Okay. All right. Um, general manager's comments? Okay. Uh, the chair is requesting permission for closed session pursuant to KRS 61810-1C for the discussion of proposed or pending litigation against or on behalf of FPB, ARS 61810-1F for discussions which might lead to the appointment, discipline, or dismissal of an individual employee, and ARS 61810-1B for the discussion of the future acquisition or sale of real property. The board's asking permission to do that. Close session. Make a motion to go into closed session. Second. Second. Okay, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. All right. Uh, we'll uh, take a little recess here, and then we'll go into closer.